what is life all of, what is this life all for? And what is the purpose and meaning of any individual's life? A sometimes troubling question for many. Longtime Westwood member Lorian Kennedy will share information from many sources this morning, as well as her personal reflections. Sensei, hello, bonjour. We acknowledge that this Treaty 6 land on which we gather here at Westwood is a traditional meeting ground and home for many indigenous peoples, including Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, and Nakota Sioux. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are with us today, those who have gone before us, and the youth who inspire us. A tradition that dates back centuries, land recognition now calls us to acknowledge that we are Treaty 6 people, to remember our responsibility, to deepen our understanding of the treaty, to participate in and support the ongoing process of truth, reconciliation, and healing. And if you're looking for ways to do this, our Reconciliation Speakers series continues on Sunday afternoon, June 1st, right here. To wow, welcome to Westwood, everyone. There is room here, and lots of room for those of you who joined us on Zoom this morning. To first time visitors or people who haven't been here for a long time, it's lovely to see you this morning. And if you would like to be on our mailing list and receive information updates about activities and events that are going on here. There is a guest book at the back and we'd be happy to have you sign it. And also on our website, if you sign, uh, if you sign up on there, you'll receive the updates as they're posted. Okay. Westwood is a compassionate Unitarian Universalist community where you're welcome to explore your spiritual beliefs and decide for yourself what they may or may not be. Where you're welcome, regardless of your gender, who you love, wealth, 
or your education, where reverence for the earth and belief in the dignity of every person inform our ethics, where music is an expression of our joy, worship brings us together to celebrate what's important in our lives, and acts of justice are a symbol of our hope. Westwood is a welcoming, nurturing, and inclusive community where all people are invited to rest, grow, and serve the world. My name is Brenda Jackson. My pronouns are she and her. I'm your service leader this week, and I'm glad you joined us today. Our thanks to the other people who help with this service, our musician, Steve Bell, Technical support are Bill Lee on Zoom, Hannah and Rebecca here at Westwood, and our coffee host David doesn't seem to have materialized yet today, so there may or may not be coffee after the service, however, you are most welcome to join us for conversation, and if you would like to be a coffee helper to ensure there's coffee every week, <laughs> we'd be happy to hear about that. All right, our speaker, Lorian, has a list of resources here up at the front and in the Zoom chat. If you want to follow up with them after the service, you're welcome to take them along. And next week, please join us for a belated May Day, which is related to the workers, with Rob Wis Wisnera. Okay, to receive those that information, all that information and events, as I said, the guest book's at the back and also on our website. All right, I'm going to ask Lorian to light the flame as I read the opening words. We kindle this flame, honoring the doorways in our souls, the windows through which we gaze at one another, the balconies where we catch glimpses of sky, the thresholds we stand on this morning, wondering, hoping, fearing, dreaming. And now for some more music, if you'd please join us as you're, and rise as you're willing and able to sing hymn 112. The words will be at the front. Ours is a welcoming community where we find connection, a spiritual community where we find meaning. Ours is a sharing community where our joys are amplified, a caring community where our sorrows are lessened. 
We take this moment to reflect on our joys and sorrows and acknowledge the mutual support of our community. If you would like, you may come forward and light a candle in silence or with a brief verbal expression of a special joy or sorrow. If you wish to, sp to speak, please uh, do so first and then go and your light your candle. Okay, as I light one last candle um, to, for all the joys and concerns that remain in our hearts, I'm going to also sneak in one for the Oilers. <laughs> Please join me in the affirmation. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our powers to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. Each week during our Sunday service, we take a few minutes to acknowledge the gifts we both bring to and receive from this com compassionate community. Gifts of talent, time, and treasure. As I mentioned earlier, we're blessed today with the musical talent of Steve Bell, the technical wizardry of our folks at the back, and uh, unfortunately not with the coffee expertise of David Williams. <laughs> However, David is here every week almost, so you know we are blessed with David's contributions many Sunday morning. We also acknowledge the gifts of time and service from those who plan, prepare, and clean up after. If you're willing and able to make a gift of treasure to sustain these services, the information to do so is on the right hand of the slide behind me, or it can be left in the donation plate, which is up here. And there are envelopes conveniently in the donation plate if you want your contribution identified so that you may receive a tax receipt. So please join me now in singing our offertory song from You I Receive. Now that we're all warmed up, we have another hymn, number 121, We'll Build a Land.
Where the heck is my purpose? I appreciate having time to think about this subject because I found a lot of material that was really interesting and I'm going to share my thoughts with you and my reflections. Sometimes we may feel we're drifting through life. Are you having trouble hearing? Okay, you can turn up the volume a bit. Um, it's not uncommon to feel that you're drifting through life. Maybe some things come to an end, a work life or a relationship. There can be a disconnection. We want to find something to hang on to, to know where life is going, that, that life is worthwhile. Paradoxically, life itself can get in the way. We start out thinking in the morning, we know the purpose of the day, but various life events sidetrack us. And at the end of the day, we think, well, I didn't actually get to do what I thought I was going to do. I think people have an expectation that there must be some big world changing direction in their lives, but they can't quite put their finger on what their goal is. We think of famous figures like Malala Yousafzai, Martin Luther King Jr., Florence Nightingale, Gandhi, Greta Thunberg. So of course there are people who are exceptional and have a clearly defined focus for their lives, but you can quickly see this doesn't happen for everyone or even for many people. Paradoxically, another thing that can confound things is having a specific goal in mind. And when we accomplish that goal, instead of feeling pleased and happy, the feeling may be a letdown. Now there's nothing to strive towards. There's nothing pulling you forward. The goal is accomplished and it's nice for a short time, but not really fulfilling not giving you any sense of something to look forward to. It might feel like confusion or boredom or loneliness or isolation. Having some reason for going on is really important to our well-being. But I'm happy to tell you that the literature says this reason for being is not unattainable. It's actually something you can cultivate. Having that sense of direction can give us something that money cannot, and it can give us a basis for deciding where we want to spend our time and what we want to do. Apparently, when the tennis player Andre Agassi reached his goal of becoming world number one tennis player and was considered one of the greatest tennis players of all time, he went through a period of depression because he had reached his goal. It's like climbing to the top of the mountain and finding out there isn't really a lot up there <laughs> and not knowing where to go next. He finally came through that experience when he realized that he could be a role model and a philanthropist. He found a new meaning for his life. So what are we talking about when we say purpose or meaning? They're not the same thing. Many of you know that I'm a retired occupational therapist, so I was interested to look at the occupational therapy model of practice. Purpose and meaning are both very important in that model, and their purpose is defined as fulfilling essential and safety needs, as well as the need for autonomy, relationships, and competence. So you might need to buy groceries and feed yourself or do the dishes or go to an appointment. Those are things you need to do they give your day some purpose. There's also the need to be self-directed and have relationships and be competent at things. But they don't really feel like they're worth living your life for. They don't give you a sense of direction. Meaning is developed through history, through life course or community history. So it's not just individual. It's also part of the community you grow up in and that history and relationships. In my work as an occupational therapist, I encountered a young woman who was in a terrible car accident with some of her friends. She was the most seriously injured and became a quadriplegic. She told me she believed she was the most seriously injured 
because she was the strongest emotionally and she was the person who could bear that better than her companions. <laughs> well, that explanation did not really much make much logical sense to me. It gave her life meaning that helped her enormously. So of course, I didn't challenge her belief. Meaning is personal. It can be really helpful and it doesn't have to make sense to anyone else. So the most interesting concept I came across in thinking about this was the concept of Ikigai. National Geographic did a study a few years ago to look at what factors lead to a long life. In a TED talk by Dan Butner, How to Live to be 100 Plus, National Geographic found four areas in the world where people live longer than typical. There were multiple reasons they live longer, but one of the ones I'm going to focus on is called ikigai, a Japanese word that doesn't have a direct translation in English, but is generally meaning the reason you get up in the morning. It can be as simple as knowing that you have to do some fishing to feed your family, or because you're a great grandmother and you want to hold and enjoy your great grandchild. Your ikigai maybe spending time doing a favorite hobby. It's not some great big distant thing. It's very immediate. The people in these long living communities don't really have a concept of retirement. They just keep doing things. Another person who's written about Ikigai is a Calgarian, Tim Tamashiro. He's written a book called How to Ikigai. There are four interlocking sections. I'll read them out, it's a bit small on the slide. You do what you love. Do what you're good at. Do what the world needs. Do what you can be rewarded for. So do what you love. Do what you're good at. Do what the world needs and do what you can be rewarded for. So I've just read about a man in Japan who has made a career of renting himself out to do nothing. <laughs> it's actually what he loves to do. <laughs> he was told when growing up that he was lazy and had no ambition, but now he has made this his whole career. <laughs> he was good at listening and being non-judgmental and generally supportive, but was not very much emotional connection. And this has been very helpful for other people. He will accompany them to events for things that they don't want to burden their friends with. He has found something he is good at and he likes doing. It's obviously something the world needs and he's now being rewarded for it. <laughs> so there's, there's no official way you can find what you love and what you're good at. That's something you have to decide for yourself. But paying attention to what you enjoy doing is a good beginning. Other things that are connected to living a long life are having a circle of friends who move through life together. The Japanese word for this is moai, moai. I realize I have a moai with friends I developed through my career way back in the late 70s and early 80s. We worked together, then started a business together. Some of you will know one of my partners, Elaine Roberts, right, uh, second from the left. I'm the one on the left, in case you don't recognize me. <laughs> <coughs> uh, we worked together, then started a business together, and some of, uh, here we are in this picture that's 1986 and the business closed in 1989 we were together there for eight years we don't work together anymore but we still have continued our relationship on through the decades meeting almost monthly for potlucks we have no other goals other than to spend time together and enjoy our friendship and that's one thing i think a church can provide something that lasts through the years and is not connected to employment or particular family relationships it's dependent though on being together repeatedly it's a wonderful bonus of being on the church board together <laughs> 
Another aspect of healthy long life <clears throat> is being able to take time out, to downshift, perhaps to spend time with friends or just to not be doing anything much. Our culture has highly valued hard work and tended to undervalue rest. Taking time to appreciate life, to enjoy beauty, leisure, and various forms of art are important. This may be where you find your meaning. You'll note that rest is part of our Westwood purpose statement. It even comes first in the list. Westwood Unitarian Congregation, a compassionate community of free religious thought, inviting all people to rest, grow, and serve the world. I found it interesting to hear about another angle on the concept of rest. In a podcast on CBC Tapestry, Tricia Hersey talks about how resting is a form of resistance to colonialism and forced labor and how grind culture is an assault on our humanity. Not all cultures value hard work as much as ours. You know, often we're not very good at figuring out what really makes us happy. The research tells us that contrary to our beliefs, money, a high prestige job, good looks, and a big house don't necessarily make us happy. I've often thought, I don't want to win the lottery. I don't even buy tickets to the lottery because I'm actually afraid of how damaging it could be if I thought people liked me because I had money. It could damage my relationships and I'd have to decide to, what to do with all the money. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I found in exploring this topic was that trying to make yourself happy trying to pursue happiness in a direct kind of way is actually not productive at all. People who work hard at being happy tend not to be very happy. Happiness comes to you as a result of other things you're doing. You can't actually make yourself happy, so it's better not to worry about that. Things that do make us happy are kindness, meditating, spending time with friends and family. So ikigai fits really well with this. It's an action word. It's doing something. As those somethings, and those somethings can be things like serving or delighting in something, enjoying a movie, going for a walk outside and enjoying nature. It could be having a good meal or making a good meal or feeding someone. It could be teaching, healing, connecting, building, and these can be done over and over. So as Tim Tamashiro says, it's not that your meaningful life is a destination you have to get to. It's something that you enjoy right now, anytime you want to, and just have little bits of joy throughout your day and week, and that adds up to a lifetime of joy. Of course, the best known expert on the topic of meaning is Viktor Frankl. He was a Jewish psychiatrist who survived the horrors of World War II and concentration camps, and soon after wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, which has become famous worldwide. He found that people were more likely to survive in concentration camps if they were oriented towards something that was meaningful to them to be fulfilled in the future. Things like wanting to meet a friend again, or a loved one, or wanting to write a book. So some of the points I've made in this rather rambling reflection are that we don't need to look far afield to find our purpose and meaning. It's probably much closer than we think. I believe in the ripple metaphor that small actions done locally have a spreading impact beyond what we may ever know about. We all have influence right near to hand. When one of his students asked Viktor Frankl what his meaning for life was, he asked the student to figure it out. And the student finally said that Frankl's life meaning was to help other people find their meaning. And that was exactly the right answer. 
As an occupational therapist, my purpose or meaning was to help people find their own meaning in life and find new ways to move forward, often after some kind of misfortune or tragedy. And I've been retired now for many years, but that meaning for my life has not really changed. I still like to think I can help people and myself find meaning, and that's one reason this congregation is important to me. It's a place to help all of us find purpose and meaning in our lives. So let's spend just a few moments in silent meditation, just thinking about our life meaning. What are the reasons to get up in the morning? Thank you. Let us burst forth in song. Hymn number 121, We'll Build the Land. Oh no, we did that one. So it's the, what is it again? One, 119. 119. 118. But it's on the screen. <laughs> happy smiley faces and shining out there um, and as we listen to the blessing of music we may may we know this ending as more than the time of goodbye may the warmth of this community and the memory of our chalice flame sustain our hearts and encourage our minds as we engage the blessings of life's challenges and joys.
and the magic of Westwood. David has materialized with coffee. Yay. Please stay and visit and help yourself to the coffee and tea from the table at the back. The handouts are at the front. And if you're still with us on Zoom, we hope you'll stay and chat with each other.